I want to introduce you to the to the next uh, presenter, who's going to be speaking on the on the topic of uh, network functions virtualization or NFV. Uh, maybe a new acronym to you uh, related to how networks are virtualized in a cloud or data center or, or, or even in a software-defined networking environment. Our, our next presenter is Don Clark. He's a network technology specialist at uh, Cable Labs. Uh, he has worked with uh, many diverse R&D teams on next generation uh, network technologies, particularly lately in uh, network functions virtualization area. Uh, He's worked uh, as co-founder of the ETSI NFV Industry Specification Group, or the NFV ISG, and that's uh, ETSI is the main group who's kind of spearheading the concept of network functions virtualization uh, around the world and st trying to standardize, standardize those types of uh, approaches. Yeah, previously, he was uh, involved with uh, VDSL technologies. So uh, please welcome Don Clark. Thanks very much. Um, I, I really appreciated being invited to this uh, this this summit. Um, as a long time uh, R and D leader, uh, formerly in BT, um, I watched the the inception of IPv6, and I watched its kind of nascent development, and then I kind of saw it kind of plateau out as a solution waiting for a problem, and then of course it became pretty apparent over the last decade or so that IPv6 is going to be critically important. So I congratulate all of you that have been involved in IPv6 development. I've not been involved myself, and I wouldn't claim to be an expert on the technology, but um, I'm pleased to, to be here to talk to you about uh, NFV. I'm now with Cable Labs since, uh, since May 2nd. I left BT um, April 30th, um, moved to the United States with my wife and family to Missouri and I joined Cable Labs on May 2nd to head up their virtualization activities in support of the cable companies. So a little bit of a transition from telco world to cable world um, for me. This diagram, uh, the NFE vision, I saw a, 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 a version of it in the last speaker's slides, <coughs> is now become, become quite familiar to, to those in the industry that are studying um, the evolution of NFE. On the left-hand side, you see the classical network appliances approach, and I loved um, the HP phrase, network functions trapped in hardware. I thought it was really good, and um, it's the first time I've heard that, but it's so apt, because once you've nailed up that function inside some metal, and you've deployed it in a rack, it's pretty, pretty hard to do very much to change uh, dramatically the functionality or even the operational uh, status of that, of that equipment, let alone reconfigure your network, rewire it on the fly in the way that the HP speaker described earlier on. So this, this idea that we could virtualize network functions, uh, or rather um, deploy software versions of network functions, isn't new. M uh, uh, and even, even most of the, of, the, um, of, the, of the concepts described for SDN are not new. They've been studied in the past in academia and even in uh, industrial research. But what I think made a difference has been the emergence of virtualization technologies for cloud, the massive scale of server uh, deployments which dwarf telecommunications hardware deployments. I think in an original white paper that um, I, I, I co-wrote, which was published in October 2012, we pointed out that there's a server shipped every nine seconds. And, and something like 9 million servers are deployed uh, every year compared with the paltry 120,000 network boxes. So we're looking at an order of magnitude of scale for IT equipment. So if you're a hardware guy, which I have to confess I am uh, since, since, uh, since a very young age, the idea that we could actually have software versions of hardware has always been very compelling. And I was one of the early adopters of field programmable gate arrays, for example, where I could just basically reprogram the thing to do the hardware function that I wanted to do. So, and, and my university major was, was, was computer systems. And so although I spent most of my career in networks, um, at the beginning of my career, I was actually a computer guy. So when the idea of virtualization first hit the network community, I was very excited about that. Um, but there were a lot of people that said, you know, Don, I know your team's doing research uh, in this area, but the last time we looked, there wasn't sufficient throughput um, to, to actually do anything meaningful from a network function perspective. 
Okay. And, and that, at that time, that was basically true. But what's actually happened in the meantime is the emergence of virtualization software has meant it's not a, a leap of, of imagination to imagine that you can have a general purpose compute infrastructure and deploy within it applications that do things that networks do. It's not a leap of faith, right, um, for that. So, that, so that was a, an important enabler. My team was approached by, my team in BT was approached by Intel, who said, who had recruited one of my colleagues, who'd retired, uh, same age as me, but he retired a couple of years earlier than I did, and they'd recruited him um, to help them target telcos as a, a significant growth area for Intel architecture based servers. Um, and we sat down in the meeting with them. I remember it's early 2011, and they said, you know, we, we'd like BT to research um, the application network functions on industry standard servers because we believe that our new data plane development kit technology, DPDK, which abstracts the compute um, stack from the, 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 the network interface um, hardware, will enable you to provide network throughputs that are compatible with today's um, demands. And I actually believed it, right? And um, I said, okay, it's, it's Intel, it's got great research, but more, more important, it's got my friend Murray Cook on the Intel side of the table. And Murray and I have known each other for many years, and he said, Don, you need to look at this. So we constructed a research collaboration with Intel and HP, as it happened, um, uh, and we, and we uh, decided that we would investigate a network use case that telco uh, net heads would recognize. Um, and I'm not going to name the use. I'm, I'm, I always resist naming the network function because when I name it, it gets reproduced around the world and people say, that's the use case that's most important. It isn't. What we did, we took a, a network element that was deployed widely within our networks, our broadband networks, and we challenged Intel and HP working with Windriver to virtualize that equivalent function, bring it to our lab, and we would throw packets at it. And we would investigate things like power consumption and the total cost of ownership of that network element equivalent virtualized. So we took an apple trapped in a hardware box, and to use the earlier analogy, we released the apple into a software environment, and we then watched the two together and saw how they grow. And we discovered not only was the throughput of the software-based network element equivalent, but with the evolution of the next stages of Intel uh, multi-core chipsets, the throughput would increase, but also the power consumption, when you take typical traffic profiles, could be reduced by a significant amount, maybe 50%, 70% energy reduction. So business, so given that my former employer um, consumes 2% of the United Kingdom's energy generation, the idea that you can deploy future networks at scale that are significantly lower energy was of great interest, right? But it's not decisive. Because the energy bill of any enterprise, as we all know, while important, is only one of the things that the finance officer looks at to try and reduce, right? But nonetheless, it was a very useful insight. The other useful insight was it, it, it was performant, and there was a roadmap for increased performance. But then the other but most exciting thing about it was that you can now turn up this network function on a general purpose uh, infrastructure and turn it off and on at will, take it out of the infrastructure by removing the virtual machine image and replace it with something else that was more useful. So we can see how we can evolve our networks in the software environment in the exact same way as cloud operators do today with their apps, right? So you look at this diagram, you see all of these functions, you can list many, many more. All of those are now feasible to be virtualized and deployed on a general purpose compute infrastructure. So that is a major, major step. So that was an inflection point in 2012 when my team published our first results on this particular use case. 
and it gained a lot of industry attention. We knew that would happen, and it was in June 2012. We'd already got another, a number of other carriers interested in what we were finding out. Uh, these included Orange, AT&T, uh, Deutsche Telekom, and a few other characters that actually I met in the car park at Open Networking Summit in April 2012. And it's a typical car park experience where I met a guy from Orange and said, I'm doing some research on network virtualization. We were, call, we were calling it virtualizing networks at the time. And they said, yes, so are we. How far have you got kind of dancing around each other a bit? And then the Telefonica guy stepped up and says, well, we've, we've already got a virtualized DPI box. We've virtualized it. We've written the code. And I was majorly impressed, because my team hadn't written any code. Um, Wind River had written all the code. And we had another partner, Veryview, um, now part of Akamai, who wrote a CDN application. And we actually had you know, co-located multiple applications running on our HP uh, infrastructure. And, um, and they'd done some other things, but written code. So I was pretty impressed with that. Out of that early car park meeting um, came a collaboration, which has been incredibly uh, influential around the world. That, that collaboration resulted in a white paper which was published in October 2012, signed by 13 carriers, which said NFV is the future for networks. And the, the, the acronym, I was talking to one of the, the, the colleagues in the break, the acronym was actually constructed and invented at a meeting that we held in Paris in 2012, where we need to find an acronym but one that meant something that wasn't usable by something else. And that's how network functions virtualization as an acronym actually got. I remember the very moment that that acronym came into being. And if you Google NFE now, it's probably one of the most uh, prolific acronyms um, in our industry. And alongside SDN, incredibly important to the future of, um, future of our industry. Um, on this diagram, which I spent a lot of time talking uh, around, um, carrier grade NAT um, is one of those functions. So we can imagine that all of the IP transition technologies could be uh, favorably virtualized. And the transition to IPv6, certainly for new infrastructure build outs, should be um, even easier with this, uh, with this, with this technology. Um, this diagram is a little bit of a construction. Um, telecommunications networks. Um, don't really look like that diagram up there. They're a little bit neater than that. But I have seen um, network installations that do look like that. And, and, the, and the diagram on the, on the right is, uh, the, the bottom right is, um, can I point at anything with this thing? Maybe not. Uh, I know, I get, I get the mouse, right? I can't do that either. So that's the University of Southampton um, data center. So you know, in 20 years time, if you build and a network point of presence, it will look exactly the same as a data center one. It won't look like that top uh, thing anymore. And that's pretty dramatic, because you can imagine that if you are a, a network field ops person who has to deal with finding and changing out one of those boxes because it's gone faulty, how many cables you've got to unplug, you've got to have the right spare, right? It might be a rack item, but it's a bespoke piece of hardware, right? You've got to have some in the store somewhere. And, and management of inventory in a telecommunications network deployed at scale, trust me, is not simple, right? You've got to, you've got to find the right replacement. You've got to hold it somewhere. You've got to make sure that it's got the right build when you plug it back into your faulty network and hope the whole thing doesn't fall over. And then somebody somewhere has got to make sure the configuration is correct. Now, you guys all know how to do this, but I don't, I don't know how to do it, but I can imagine it's a nightmare. In the virtualized world, it will be completely different, right? Yes, there will be hardware failures. But now you're unplugging an industry standard server. But you've not, you don't have to worry about doing it, because you've actually just de redeployed the workload to another server inside your infrastructure. And now, when it comes to network resilience, instead of having 1 plus, a, 1, plus 1, 1 plus n, with all of the cabling nightmares, all of the alarm nightmares, you can do network function pooling within your cloud infrastructure. So you can imagine all kinds of application network-specific resilience scenarios that can be invented and will be invented in this new world of software-based networking. 
I've explained the origins of, uh, of this, but this picture is rather personally very important to me because in, in sort of bringing together the carriers, you never know when you're at the beginning of something how fast or how significant the initiative will be. And there's no, no people who know more about that than you guys in IPv6, because when you, the early visionaries who, who decided that IPv6 would be needed, and it wasn't needed for many years, but has, is now critically necessary, this has got the same status as that, in the sense that we didn't know whether NFE would resonate with the industry. We didn't know whether collaboration around it would be possible for all kinds of, 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 of reasons. Um, but none of us could have, have, have envisaged that within uh, less than two years, we, a research idea validated by vendor collaboration would lead to one of the world's most significant telcos headline on the bottom right in the Financial Times of the UK which is not a trivial, um, not a trivial paper because it, it documents events that influence the share prices of whole industries. And AT&T declared its future would be to virtualize its network. All of that from a research to a, a, a change in strategy, which is now a f very significant around the industry. And the bottom left hand tre trend for network functions, virtualization, and being a British person, um, I spell it with an S. But Google insist in not recognizing it with an S. They only recognize it with a Z or a Z, as we would say. So the spelling of virtualization, unfortunately, I resisted for, we're editing a third white paper now. It's still got an S in it. But when I stop being the editor, I know it will go to the Z. And so all of you will be seeing it with a Z. It's just a little bit of an, an English um, holding out for the English spelling of something. So I've actually talked through a lot of the benefits already. Um, any of you that work or have anything to do with cloud-based um, uh, uh, infrastructures will know that all of these benefits accrue once you un untrap or, or release the, the, head, the network functions into the, into the cloud um, environment. But there are challenges, so let's talk a bit about the challenges, which is why the industry is collaborating on, on NFE. It's really hard to change the culture within organizations that have existed for 100 years that deploy infrastructures at scale to millions of end users, they are engineered to be extremely efficient at the operations and deployments of those networks. Inserting a dramatic new capability into those organizations is hard to do. Um, there's a, almost like an allergic reaction. You know, the, 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 there, there are those that say it will not work. How will I fault it if I can't see the red light? How will I know it's gone wrong? And you have to go through a journey of education where you repeat again and again why it's necessary, but you have to be doing that in the way in a business benefit context. So you have to talk about business benefits. And this is where I spent a little bit too long in my early career in R&D, right? Because when you're an R&D guy, it's like kind of in your nature to see the future so clearly. This is how it's going to be. But then you go and talk to a, a dyed-in-the-wool ops guy whose job it is to find a fault in a cable that's six foot in the ground, um, in a hole that is filled with six foot of water that's got to be pumped out. Um, and then you've got to do a gas check so that you don't explode when you go down there trying to explain to him why this future is going to happen. You have to actually talk to them in ways that they understand. So NFE has been a journey for the last two years. Most of the collaboration effort is around trying to get alignment in understanding, not just amongst the carriers, the cable companies um, whom I now serve, and the vendors, but everybody needs to understand what they're talking about. So even SDN means different things to different people. So with NFE, We've tried to converge understanding on terminology. 
And then what we tried to do is show how portability of network functions between hardware platforms can be achieved, right, without you know, performance dropping dramatically unless you do the right thing. So there's a lot of education and fairly standard IT practices that need to be brought to bear. And networks people don't get these things very well. Um, in fact, it took a long time for some networks people to really get this. But now that they get it, they can see it, and they're excited about it. Um, manager, managing and orchestrating virtual network functions while ensuring security integrity. Now, the difference between the enterprise and the telco is that the telco, the enterprise controls its, its, its IT environment. In a telco, you control your IT environment, but it serves a whole set of, of users, um, including enterprises, that demand reliability and, connected, and, and assurance of connectivity. So we can't just do things in the telco environment that, that, that will undermine um, our, our services. And, that, and that's going to be one of the challenges for NFE, is to change the processes within those organizations so that they can uh, adapt to them, but still have confidence that these infrastructures will deliver the same or better um, levels of service that, that they, they've been led to, led to expect. The other, the other thing about uh, our industry is, and, and very much so with IPv6, I'm sure, has been the, is the time it takes to develop standards. In the networks world, interoperability is crucial. If I make a phone call in the UK, I expect it to ring a phone in Siberia. That's, and it has to transit multiple domains. Interoperability is key to our industry. Interoperability requires fairly rigorous specifications and standards. But this is not how the cloud industry works. Um, this morning I was at SCTE in a DevOps session where they were discussing you know, the, the various experiences around DevOps. That in itself is the kind of world where you know, developers of this kind of software environment and operations people will need to work very closely together. First of all, to bootstrap joint knowledge and culture and then to actually work collaboratively so that they can implement these infrastructures in ways that are very, now very unfamiliar to them. So one of the things that I talk a little bit about uh, whenever I go anywhere is the need for, for organizations to, to, to think about the skill changes. Um, IT people are in short supply. Um, networks people are in increasingly shorter supply. In this world, there will be more need for IT skills than there will be for network skills. And, and the illustration of that was I, I, I visited um, uh, PayPal last year. I'd met uh, Vinay Banai, who used to work for a company called Antran, um, at a conference. And Vinay was talking about um, how PayPal were virtualizing um, you know, some of the um, equipment within their, within their data centers to, to, to uh, coming back to the earlier speaker's point about being locked into hardware means you can't innovate at your own, with your own scope. You're limited to the shapes of these pieces. And Vinay was recruited by PayPal as a network architect. And when I met with Vinay, he brought in some dyed-in-the-wool, hard-nosed IT ops people that run PayPal's network today. There were five of them and one of him. So that tells you something about the skill inf inversion that will happen right, once we software-define networks. Um, so the people that can marry network skills and IT skills together be very special people, and there's not many of those people around in the world today. The ADSI NFE Institute, so when, when we published um, the Joint Carrier White Paper in October 2012, um, we also uh, announced the formation of the ADSI um, Industry Specification Group. Now this is a group which I didn't actually want to be started this way because it looked too much like a, a conventional standards organization, which I didn't want this to become. What I felt was needed was a collaborative effort to align requirements, mainly. But it turns out in today's world, um, carriers will only join forums where they either are members already or there is a strategic intent within that forum for that particular organization. So we, we considered a lot of options. And the only one that met the criteria that the founding carriers were members already. In other words, they'd signed the IPR documents, right? So the lawyer of AT&T, the lawyer of BT, did not have to work on a new legal document, which when you're coming from R&D, you're telling your execs, can you sign this IPR agreement, which is then going to 
hold your organization accountable for your IPR inputs. They don't want to do that unless there's a big business benefit. So founding new forums is hard. Go for the ones that exist already. And so this is where we, why we went to Etsy. The industry specification group idea is that they, is, there is open membership. So you don't need to be a member of Etsy in order to join the Etsy um, NFE ISG. And this was particularly important to us as carriers because although we, we, we know and love our big vendor partners, many of whom are represented at this conference, we also recognize the innovation dynamic of the small independent software um, industry that is, is flowering in, in Silicon Valley and other places. So we wanted those guys to play a part in helping us um, grow uh, a new ecosystem and not just to be reliant upon um, the existing partners for that future innovation, many of whom were certainly at the beginning somewhat suspicious of the idea that we were no longer going to buy their boxes we were going to buy software licenses and buy somebody else's boxes. This was a, a kind of fairly disruptive idea within many organizations, um, including inside carriers too, right? You're going to tell the networks people that you're going to build data centers in the future and they, you don't need them anymore. There's kind of a, a, you know, a, a difficulty there in terms of moving forward. So the other thing is was low barriers to entry. No, even, even a big telco doesn't like paying, writing big checks for a membership of anything, let, us, let alone a small vendor that wants, you want to play a part in this. So low fees was also one of the um, ideas. Um, so from a paper, a meeting in, at ONS in April 2012, the coining of NFE as an acronym in June 2012, the publication of a white paper in October 2012, the first meeting of the Etsy NFE um, three months later in, in, um, in Sofia Antipolis in January 2013, the first outputs were published in October 2010, in less than 10 months, which I think is a pretty impressive rate, but not as fast as, as some DevOps people can, can issue code releases. It still takes time. Um, first of all, we documented nine um, use cases that spanned the industry, right? Everything from virtualizing a home network to virtualizing um, an edge router. Anything that we recognize today as being significant for any operator, whether it be a mobile carrier operator, a fixed network operator, or a cable company, or even an enterprise, we documented those, those nine use cases as a, as, as a consensus um, document. We then set out to document the high level business requirements for NFE. So, not just technology, things like you know, the ability to, to, to have service level guarantees, um, you know, the, the targets to reduce energy consumption, the things that we recognize as being important business benefits are documented in, in that document. Probably the most influential document is the NFE architectural framework. This took a huge amount of effort to broker agreement. Um, not only were vendors um, at times at loggerheads over this architecture because the implication of this architecture is if you don't see a piece of it, a piece of your product roadmap in it, or you can't see where you're going to play, you're effectively going to sign up to something which means you no longer exist. So it's really quite contentious. And even some of the operators, it, it, it was contentious. By this time, we, we have nearly 25 operators, right? It's gone from from five in the car park to 13 at paper to 25 operators. And, and we, some of them said, but ah, but, but this implies a dramatic shift in my OSS strategy. This is not the message I'm currently sending my vendors, right? So the messaging around even the northbound um, interfaces for this were quite important to the operators. But there were many late night sessions, I remember one very, very, very vividly, um, there was a lot of beer consumed at a particular table and I'd step back because I, as chair of the Network Operator Council, I was you know, somewhat, you know, somewhat you know, intimidating to some of these people. Um, so I stepped out, but I watched them and I, and I watched them on, with, with pieces of paper and napkins and, and the next morning an agreement was brokered on this framework. And this framework, if you Google NFE architectural framework, you'll see this, this, this diagram, and I don't even have it in my own presentation, so I apologize for that, um, is reproduced around the world because vendors and operators are showing their partners, customers, where they fit 
inside this architecture in terms of giving confidence um, that they are on the right track with their products. We've aligned some of the terminology and we issued a call for proof of concepts where we wanted vendors to work together to create NFV demonstrations based on um, the requirements we'd outlined. And the only criteria, uh, criteria for um, participating in an approved concept were they needed to be at least two vendors. So in other words, we're trying to grow an ecosystem uh, with interoperability or partnership and at least one operator. So it didn't matter what you proposed, but you had to have an operator sponsor it. This way we avoided um, having to do a selection process or have some kind of gating process. Um, it was simply pragmatic. We trusted the carriers within the group to, to actually endorse um, the proof of concepts. And we went from October 2013 of a, as a call for proof of concepts, and today there are 23 uh, NFV proof of concepts are, um, in progress or, or have been completed. Whenever you go to a conference now, you are bound to see NFV. There'll be a proof of concept somewhere, sometime, um, claiming uh, to be uh, compliant with, uh, with the Etsy um, NFV architecture framework. And we do actually control that quite well. Etsy is very concerned to avoid some kind of branding reuse when actually there's nothing there. So you know, the endorsement around this, any of you that have been involved in this, maybe there's IPv6 types events and TM Forum Catalyst events, they're the same. You want to try and avoid that people are just doing PR and they're undermining what you're trying to achieve. Um, the main thing I just really want to, to draw attention to um, is, is the upcoming release of, of NFV ISD documents due in December. Um, these are already available on, on the Etsy portal in draft form. These are going to be openly published and they are going to be highly influential uh, across the industry, both in terms of informing product roadmap developments uh, and informing um, standard development organizations' work. So, we're, so we've got some tweaks to the architectural framework. Um, there's an overview of, of use cases. Um, there, there are some very good tutorial insights into what are the important um, parameters for hypervisors um, the, the idea of, of having best practices around portability and, and performance um, and um, the, the ability to, to provide fault management in, um, information to, to, to the ISS and BSS. Probably the most significant challenge around NFV is management and orchestration. So the idea today that OSSs and BSSs are primarily static, they you configure, you monitor, and you, and you let the network do its thing. In the SDN world, as was illustrated earlier on, the, the OSS or the SDN controller is, is orchestrating flows, creating flows dynamically. NFV is the same. To reach NFV's full potential, you want to be able to dynamically reconfigure your network topology on the fly. And you do that in a way that does not interrupt network services. So that is completely new, right? No one in networks um, has done this before. Um, companies like HP and others are a long way down that road because they are very heavily involved in cloud um, infrastructures. But merging the disciplines and the rigor of network infrastructure with the somewhat anarchic open source ethos of cloud is one of the biggest challenges. And the management and orchestration document takes you through um, quite a few of those challenges and outline some of the solutions to that. Security is an area of, um, always an area of, of, of interest for networks people. What we've done is we've looked at the deltas for, secur for, for security uh, on NFE infrastructures. So we've pulled together some of the world's best networks expert, uh, security expert, expertise. And that's one of the, 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 the advantages of collaboration because if you bring currently 34 carriers, probably well over 90% of the world's networks are represented in this forum, that's a fairly big magnet for vendors and for experts who then realize that their ideas have got an impedance to work into. You know, there's, there's, there's 34 sets of ears that are listening to your insights. Okay. And so we've got a security expert group, very small, but brought from, from right across the industry. Uh, and they've looked at the, the deltas for NFE uh, from a security perspective. Uh, 
and they've published a, a problem statement, which is a very good list of, of security areas. Um, uh, and some of them are really quite difficult ones to, 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 to deal with. Um, things like lawful intercept, for example, is something which enterprises won't be familiar with, but certainly are critical uh, for public infrastructures. And those documents are freely available on the, or will be freely available on the, on the Etsy website. I've talked a little bit about the proof of concepts. There are currently over 50 vendors involved in these. They span most of the technology challenges for NFV. Uh, they span all of the use cases and they span all of the architectural framework. Very interesting set of documents which you can go and look at. Um, you know, real stuff being put together by real, real vendors um, uh, 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 along with uh, their operator partner. But, you know, the first phase, you know, quantity is not everything, of course, quality is everything. And so going forward, we want more focus on interoperability. So we're looking at creating a new proof of concept framework that will um, somehow pro help us progress and encourage interoperability for these different functions. Because today, if you buy um, you know, a, a network appliance from one vendor and a different type of network appliance from another vendor and plug them together, you know, they're Ethernet, they're gonna, they're gonna at least work at, 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 the, at the Ethernet level, you configure them and provide all the standards are, uh, are implemented properly, these things will interoperate. Now what we're gonna do, we're gonna deploy a server or a rack of servers or even a data center full of servers and we're gonna, we're gonna turn up virtual machines we're going to load virtual network functions. We're going to chain the connectivity together within that infrastructure. And that somehow has got to be brought together and work. Now, that is a whole different ball game to plugging two appliances together, right? I think you'll agree with me. So there's a whole new paradigm shift for networks people to design interoperable um, infrastructures based on, on software. Um, I put this slide up a bit early, uh, but here it is. So. Coming from, coming from a telco environment, um, if you mention open source, um, there's gonna be some, some interesting comments about that. Um, not all of them positive. Um, because being telcos, we like to control things, right? And the whole thing about open source is you don't control it. It's meritocracy, it's a community, it's diverse, it's not controlled by anybody. And so that is kind of like a cultural, 180 degree cultural shift away from the way in which telcos think. Um, so, so, but however, even though we may think that way, inside most of those appliances, the chances are a Linux stack and, a, and, a, and, and other bits of open source software implemented in there by the vendor. It's just that they're trapped inside that box and you don't see them, right? Now what you're gonna say is actually you're gonna buy uh, pieces of your infrastructure literally as images of open source software, that begins to, 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 to bring so, some, some, um, some new ideas uh, and concerns. So one of the things that, we've, that we set out to do was to bring about a more coordinated approach to open source for um, networks. So there's a new initiative for, for NFE which is gonna be out of the box um, imminently um, called Open Platform for NFE. And what it is, it's really a collaborative effort to drive code into upstream projects like Linux, like OpenStack, like Open Daylight, and, and by coordinating the, the code inputs, we can avoid duplication across the industry. And we can have those, 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 open, those open source projects implementing the, the key requirements that everybody needs and for us then to use those to create our own uh, propositions. So a key objective is to create uh, an open hardware and software environment reference platform um, funded um, by the participants within the project. Um, some of those test beds will be virtual. Um, some of them will be physical. There will be environments that Cable Labs uh, will implement on behalf of our MSO partners, uh, members. There'll be um, test beds that will be implemented by each of the carriers. 
And of course, for the major vendors, there'll be test beds there as well. And software developers who don't have those kind of resources will be able to, uh, to, to um, uh, access a virtualized um, environment OPNFE will provide for the communities at large. Um, and I was one of the, ins the guys that, that started the initial discussions on that. Um, and I'm really pleased to, 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 to predict that it's going to be a fairly major um, influence on driving open source for NFE going forward. So in summary, um, I didn't think I'd talk for this long. Um, NFE will transform the design and operation of public and enterprise networks. If you don't know about NFV now, there's plenty of stuff out there. Um, read it. It's going to help you um, figure out where networks is going to be heading and help you work through how I, the IPv6 transition um, can be e e e even simpler uh, and, and with less risk implemented. Um, of course, we're leveraging the IT industries, and, and Google was mentioned in a, um, the student who... who uh, it was on here at lunch. One of the things he said to me was, uh, said to me, he said to you, was um, they'd, they'd contacted Google and got no response. Um, the, the fact is, what Google are doing is incredibly important because they're driving scale for, um, for, for, for cloud. But increasingly, I detect that they have got secret hardware um, enablers for what they're doing, which means there may be divergence. What I'm more interested in is the industry converging. And uh, since we, we, we um, released NFV into, 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 into the public domain, there's been a very interesting uptick of innovation in the hardware domain. So hardware is, is the new software, you know, programmable fabrics, um, FPGA-based uh, interface cards with standardized uh, plug-in server interfaces, but with APIs that would then ab abstract those functions to our NFE infrastructure or our SDN infrastructure, meaning that you can envisage that although the NFE vision is to use industry standard servers, the idea is actually probably there's going to be accelerators of very exciting types that will be abstracted via APIs and be reusable. So if you're a hardware guy, trust me, NFV is not the death of hardware. It could be actually a stimulus to certain types of programmability within the hardware domain. We always say that NFV is complementary to software-defined networks. In fact, when um, Dan Pitt of the Open Networking Foundation heard about the white paper it was, in, was, in, uh, was, in, was in creation, um, he contacted me and said, Don, could we could we talk? And um, he was concerned, rightly, well, not rightly, but wrongly, that somehow what we were doing in NFE would undermine or deflect attention from the Open Networking Foundation and the SDN work that they were doing. I said, Dan, to the contrary, we are, these things are complementary, they're, they're, they're highly synergistic, and what we're going to be doing is going to be entirely co complementary to you. So we, there was a mention in the original white paper of the ONF and the important role there. But since then, we've built a collaboration with the ONF. And right now, there's some joint proof of concepts that are being constructed with the Open Networking Foundation and the Etsy NFE ISG to look at how SDN technologies or techniques can increase the utility of, of NFE and vice versa. Because at the end of the day, to realize its full potential, SDN needs programmable network features and functions. Um, with that, I will say thank you. And more than happy to take questions um, or booze or claps, anything. Go for it. We, we've seen with server virtualization that that tends to have driven the number of servers way up because it's a lot easier now just to keep instantiating a lot of a lot of ones in the past, you might have tried to squeeze the most out of one piece of hardware. And we, we've seen estimates anywhere from 2x to 10x the number of servers now over what have been in a purely physical world. Do you have any projections that with network functions, that would there be a great desire to have a lot more little instantiations than great big ones if it's now a virtualized function, do you think? 
do you, do you mean do you mean physical instantiations of server points of presence? Do you mean like small data centers or? Well, the actual function itself, so let's say it's an SBC or something, almost all of those instantiates as an IP address or a series yeah. that represents services. So would you expect to see an explosion of, oh, there used to be 10 big SBCs, now there's 5,000 little ones because yeah. that's the desire of how to do it? That's an interesting question because actually that question can be applied right across the network space. Mm -hmm. And I think that what I, I believe um, is that we're right at the very beginning of a new network discipline. So. I think the way in which networks will be designed in the future will be strongly influenced by the flexibility that you have. So certainly for, for, for carriers, diversity of presence is key, right? So you know, unlike Google, you've got 100 data centers and you make sure they're where there are you know, major electricity generators and all that kind of stuff. For a telco, you're limited, or, or a cable company, you're limited to being within a mile of your, of your customer endpoint, your cable. Your, your, your DSL link, or whatever it is, your fiber. So I think what will happen is that there will be natural places where you locate network functionality in the telco world that will be different to big data center operators. And so I kind of imagine a kind of edge cloud. And if, if you're then sort of designing networks in a physically fragmented way, then the topologies that you would then use in a logical sense for your network will change. So, so I think yes, I think the answer is yes, but it's not specifically to SBCs, but you will see this kind of diversity of, of functionality replicated. So say we have a huge box somewhere, um, certainly using SDN techniques, for example, you can imagine that you could do you know, scaling out by smaller pieces rather than just sticking in a great big box somewhere. Yeah, the, scal the scalability, the, the, there's a very interesting research paper which I, which I advise you to read. Um, is that there's another, there's another, okay, so business benefits. I didn't mention too many business benefits. I mentioned energy consumption. But one of the things which in my, my former team, we, we had a tagline which was um, to deploy a network service in a particular presence, a location. Uh, currently, if you deploy bespoke appliances, it takes 90 days. Um, once you've deployed the server there, you can deploy the, the service in 90 seconds or whatever it is to turn up the virtual machine. So, 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 so coming back to your point, you know, the idea that you can scale um, at will means that you can also do things like have highly resilient networks. So the unfortunate tsunami incident in Japan where the voice networks went down just at the time when the relatives of the people that were affected were trying to get hold of them and there's a massive spike in, in calls in call demand, which, which caused the Japanese telephone network to fall over, um, there has been a major study in Japan at how NFE and SDN techniques can be applied so that in a future scenario, um, you know, the network is essentially resilient because you say, for example, and this idea of over-provisioning today is, is, is unavoidable, um, but in, a, in an NFE world, you don't need to over-provision. You simply turn up the virtual machines when you need them. Of course, you need to have enough hardware resources there, but for example, in this scenario, the entity Docomo illustrated, you know, with video resources um, normally being uh, the, major, the major workload, right, for streaming, whatever, in a, in a disaster scenario, those workloads could be removed and voice workloads replace them. And they showed by their research project the equivalent of a 200,000 um, end user network streaming video, a disaster occurred, and they reconfigured uh, through a standby data center located 500 miles away. They turned down all the CDN resources, turned up the voice resources within 30 minutes, and they restored voice service in a way that was impossible before. Of course, that's a special um, use case. Doesn't drive my business benefits necessarily, but you can get the drift, right? CDN resources can be traded at will for other types of network resources. I was speaking with a vendor recently and they were touting this virtual product and that virtual product. Is that just a coincidence or is that them reading the work you're doing and trying to respond and stay relevant? Um, everybody, everybody wants to be perceived 
to be on the page, right? Um, but it's going to take time for for this to, to, to happen at scale. Um, there are lots of analysts that are trying to predict when, when this is going to happen, but truthfully, this is happening now. Um, where, where NFE is being deployed where it makes sense today already. Um, so there are, there are real claims that, that actually match reality for some of these. Um, others where it took probably about a year from the first white paper publication to a detectable shift in vendor strategy. It took about a year. Um, it's like a bit of rabbits in a headline. Is this white paper just an R&D white paper, right? What's the reality of this white paper? And, and so with the, for about a year, you didn't see very much happen. And then suddenly there's a big uptick because the old Gartner hype curve kicks in. And by the way, we tried really hard to suppress the Gartner hype curve on NFV. We did nothing. We, we didn't do anything. We didn't talk. Um, we had no press releases. We didn't want to feed the fuel. We just wanted to be grounded and rea in reality. But you can't stop commercial entities wanting to, 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 you know, to, to have the NFE brand. The, the truth is just go and look. You know, what's real? Um, ask them to show you something. Ask them to tell you where it's deployed um, and what's the experience. The mic on. Yeah, my mic's on. Nope, it's not. Can you hear me? That's, there we go. There we go. So just just to recap, this harkens back to about 12 years ago. John Strassner's software. Uh, it, it was a Cisco software fellow was doing directory enabled networking and policy based network management. Um, but now this. Is, is similar in that logical abstraction control plane management over network functions that uh, now it's for a hypervisor and for cloud. So some of the work that's going on, for example, land mobile radio is migrating to digital narrowbanding. If anybody's heard of P25, emergency communications, it's analogous to the same kind of transition we're seeing from IPv4 to IPv6. The, there's a fundamental problem with the reliability of circuit switched or Plano telephone service, how that was engineered for reliability when you, re, when you mention resilient networks, that moving to IP is inherently not as resilient, not as reliable as those engineered to be communication systems. I believe that SDN and NFE offer a solution to that fundamental problem of resilience and availability. I'd like to get your comments on that, Don. Well, first of all, I know I'd admire John Strasner. Uh, John has been a, an active contributor to the work of uh, our work, I, and that now works for Huawei, I believe. Um, so acknowledging John's work, um, certainly there's a journey from that work to where we are today. Um, there is a big debate around resiliency um, Indeed, there's a white, white paper, new white paper that's going to be coming out in, in um, middle of the next month, an update which talks a little bit more about resiliency. In fact, the, the resiliency um, paper is available from the website, discusses some of those things. But I've, for example, there are many different ways of increasing resilience once you, once you convert networks into a software environment. You know, of course, you have to have some hardware topology that delivers the resilience, right? You can't just have it all sitting on one server. Um, so some of the old tried and tested techniques of dual physical um, um, duality will, need, will be needed and can't be avoided. But there are now infinite possibilities, and I, and I use that word almost deliberately, infinite possibilities to architect networks with arbitrary levels of resilience. Um, the IETFs just started a, a discussion group on VNF pooling, virtual network function pooling, for example, where you actually have pre you know, a pool of virtual network functions. And, you know, in order to implement your network, you just need a subset of those. But as soon as you detect failures, you know, the pool is reconfigured, and now you've, you've turned back the network. And you can have physical diversity, you can have logical diversity, um, any different ways. I think if you're a reliability engineer, you're going to be very excited um, by this. In fact, you know, 
having spent most of my life in, in research, um, I, this is the most exciting change in networks in, in my 40 years, for sure, right? It's, it takes me back to my, you know, my roots of computing I mentioned earlier on. Suddenly, the things that we were kind of demonstrating crudely at university are now possible, but they're possible and will be delivered at scale. And that means whole um, new research disciplines will arise around networks. For the first time, networks will be sexy again, because now, you've, instead of being nailed up to whatever appliances you can buy, um, don't, you're not nailed up to anything now. You can, you can invent any new network topology, application aware or not application aware. You can do anything you want. Um, and, but the trick is, to, is, is that openness of the ecosystem. So, you know, it really is important that the hardware is abstracted properly so that, the, you know, the software guys are released to use those compute resources in the way that um, enterprise cloud operators do. So there's going to be new business uh, models. I think one of the ones was mentioned earlier on, telcos could potentially lease network infrastructures and they could be multi-tenancy. So suddenly you can see that, you know, and I'm kind of going off on a bit of a ramble, Dan, stop me. Um, just like so, you can conceive mobile operators sharing, right, base station locations. What, AT&T, Verizon, they're on that building over there? Yeah, because they realized they could save a whole lot of cost. Suddenly you can imagine that telcos could share network infrastructures in a multi-tenant software environment. Whole new business models arise from that. You know, uh, you know that's, it, and, and so we've, we've also started debate with academia Academia are on this already, not surprising, because SDN came out of academia, Stanford University. So we've got a whole engagement across the industry on research, and more importantly, the point I mentioned earlier on, is that we want students to come out of university with new multi-skilled abilities, right? So we want curricular courses to be changed. The University of Boulder needs to have a new course next year on, on X and to start new research fellowships around this so that you know, in five years, we'll get multi-skilled architects who can do, who are just as comfortable in this environment as today's generation are with, with the virtual, with, with the physical ones. I think as you're hitting your break time, I'll be around for a few minutes in the break. If anybody wants to have a, a chat, um, then I'm heading off back to Missouri um, to the airport. So um, thank you very much for listening and uh, inviting me.